Hello ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. A few days ago on this channel we looked at Battletoads, the simple NES game inspired by the turtles created by British company Rare that would help lead to the company investing in expensive silicon graphics computers for the development of their future titles. One of the first games created in this new era was of course Killer Instinct the smash hit 1994 arcade game inspired by Mortal Kombat which was published in the arcades by Midway. At this point in time Rare were a second party developer for Nintendo. This enabled the game to be programmed to run on the Ultra 64 arcade board, a board which was said to be an arcade based version of the upcoming Ultra 64 home console which we all know would be released as the Nintendo 64 when it eventually hit store shelves. The original arcade game announcer Chris Sutherland would even proudly exclaim that the game would be available in your homes in 1995 only on the Ultra 64. When this arcade game was originally released consumers salivated at the prospect of taking this game home as this slip for its time looking game paired with great sound, graphics and a unique combo system subverted players expectations as this was a time when Nintendo was still known for their stance against violent video games. The game was one of many reasons in 1994 for people to be excited about the future and what the Nintendo 64 was soon to surely deliver. In today's content we are going to go back to look at this game, its history and how the franchise went from one of Rare's most hottest properties of the mid 90s to a game few people cared about by the time it arrived on the 64 home console. So after the longest intro ever, this ladies and gentlemen is the mad story of Killer Instinct Gold, the fighting game that was dead on arrival? Yeah. If you can remember the release of Killer Instinct 26 years ago, you will remember just how beloved this game was. The title is one of those games that would catch players eyes in bowling alleys, kebab shops and pubs, past the point of arcade game being in its prime. The game was promoted as a snapshot of what was to come when Nintendo released their Ultra 64 game console. The revolutionary sequel to the Super Nintendo that was set for a 1995 release. The game on release was loud and attention grabbing, with a graphical style unlike anything else on the market. The game was the first arcade title to feature an internal hard disk drive in addition to the game's ROMs, which allowed it to store massive amounts of data, thereby giving it the ability to add more detailed graphics than other games of the fighting genre. Through the use of silicon graphics computers, pre-rendered sprites were created that featured movement patterns captured using motion capture software, and backgrounds were made and stored as movies, which adjust frames based on the player's movements. Pair this with the game's unique combo system, appealing character lineup, fatality-like finishes and boisterous voice samples, Killer Instinct was a game that no one could forget so everyone eagerly awaited for the Ultra 64 so they could bring this game home. Sadly though, the Ultra 64 would not arrive in 1995 like Nintendo had touted previously. With regards to the delay, the chairman of Nintendo of America, Howard Lincoln, would shed some light on the matter, stating, The delay was necessary to give software developers time to learn the new machine and to create suitable games. The New York Times would point out that few independent software developers have publicly committed to the Ultra 64 so far, and many analysts expected the machine to ship with relatively few game titles, primarily those created by Nintendo in-house. Looking back at the Nintendo 64 in hindsight, as we know this seems to be a problem that Nintendo were never able to rectify with the platform, and throughout the system's life cycle it seemed to forever lack in third party titles compared to both its predecessors and competition. With the Ultra 64 now delayed, paired with consumers demand for a Killer Instinct home title, development for the home version of the game would be shifted away from the Ultra 64 and moved over to the more basic aging Super Nintendo thus meaning that Chris Sutherland's promise at the beginning of the arcade game was sadly not fulfilled. 
When the game was ported over to the 16-bit hardware, the game would obviously be altered and lose many of its bells and whistles. After all, this was a game that was meant to be destined for the 64. Despite this though, demand for this game was through the roof. So in total, 3.2 million people would purchase the game for the Super Nintendo. The 1995 port was one of the most technically impressive games ever released on the hardware, despite the downgrade from the arcade it had received. There were vast changes made to this version, all of which I covered in my original Killer Instinct video. But importantly, the Killer Instinct spirit and flavour was all present in this game, resulting in the title being one of the most memorable games in the Super Nintendo's library. After Rare, Midway and Nintendo made a ton of money off of this title, the next move would be simple, develop an arcade sequel which would hopefully be ported to the Ultra 64 whenever the damn platform sees a release. The arcade game known as Killer Instinct 2 would arrive in 1996, two years after the original entry in the series. The game looked to build on the original by adding a few new characters to the lineup, new stages, bigger sprites and tweaks to the gameplay mechanics to give this title more finesse than that of its predecessor. For example, adding a super bar, like in more recent Street Fighter games. According to designer Ken Lobb, Eliminating excessive defence play was the absolute highest priority. He felt that this was not a problem for experts, but it hurt beginners. We now reward the aggressor big time. Fondly remembering playing this game in the arcades myself in 1996, I can confirm, for myself at least, Killer Instinct still felt like an exciting licence. And I was thrilled when I got the opportunity to play this game shortly after its release. The new characters were a particularly welcome addition to the game. Journalists though and game critics from the time were less impressed. Next Generation would criticise the game for essentially being recycled from the 1994 entry. They would also note that the game was slower and featured a choppier frame rate to the original and would criticise the gameplay itself too, stating, if you like the style of fighting that relies more on memorising combos than hand-eye coordination and, in a way, skill, Killer Instinct 2 is full of that same fighting style. Like the first game though, many people still wanted to take this one home. And if, like myself, you had spent a great deal of time playing the Super Nintendo Killer Instinct game, Killer Instinct 2 in the arcades would look even more impressive in comparison to the 16-bit title we were all used to. So once again we would sit and wait patiently for this title to debut on the Ultra 64. But once again, this was something that was never to be. And what we would get eventually would be a Killer Instinct game under another title, which was of course Killer Instinct Gold. Killer Instinct Gold would be a game that would not arrive on the Ultra 64 until late November of 1996 in the US, and not until July bloody 1997 in the UK. A Killer Instinct game was finally available on the Nintendo 64. But in my region at least, years after the time period the game was originally slated for. When it comes to the development of Gold, an interesting factoid is that during the development of Killer Instinct 2, the arcade game, the team would be split during development as soon as the true Nintendo 64 development kit arrived at Rare's headquarters. This would mean that some of the team members would continue to work exclusively on the arcade game, whilst others would be designated to work on Gold. In fact, this could help go to explain why Killer Instinct 2 suffers from some issues the first game in the series didn't, but this is just my personal conjecture at this point. In order to produce Killer Instinct Gold, Rare would take what they had already created for Killer Instinct 2 and use compression technology to fit the arcade version onto a Nintendo 64's very tiny cartridge. The very style cartridge that would stop the majority of developers wanting to even go near the Nintendo 64. As we all know, back in 1994, the first Killer Instinct was designed to be a game that would showcase how powerful the Nintendo 64 was, and how the system was more capable than its competition. However, when Rare eventually received the development kit for the home console, the Nintendo 64 was not really capable of delivering an experience close to the arcade game from 1994. Since Killer Instinct, as we know, was a game that was synonymous with the upcoming Ultra 64 back in the day, Gold would end up being announced as one of the very first launch titles revealed for the hardware. But due to the game not being the easiest to convert from an arcade title over to a console game, 
The title was delayed, arriving in November 1996 in the US, as mentioned earlier, and Europe obviously in mid-1997. On release, Killer Instinct Gold will be presented as an upgraded version of Killer Instinct 2, rather than a butchered port. And to be fair, an argument could be made for the game to be both of these things, as the game gives and takes a lot from the second arcade game. Killer Instinct Gold may suffer from multiple graphical downgrades, but in terms of the gameplay itself, the title does a good job of remaining faithful to the arcade original. In terms of changes, characters no longer have multiple unique endings each, due to the Nintendo 64 small cartridges, and instead only feature one ending each, but not all is negative with this game. The game now features team battles and team elimination battles, the latter of which involves players having to finish their opponents off with actual finishing moves basically Mortal Kombat style gory fatalities. Like many home conversions of fighting games, Killer Instinct Gold features a training mode which allows players old and new to learn the moves of each character and practice combos, doubles and auto doubles etc. Basically all the fighting techniques that are synonymous with Killer Instinct. Again, with the home version of the game, there is now an options menu. This allows players access to a certain level of customization. For example, modifying the game's speed, color of blood, button configuration and save data. Lots of simple things really. The game features some unlockables too. For those who persist with it, such as some alternative colors for sprites and some faster gameplay modes. Unlike Killer Instinct in the arcades, Gargos, the game's final boss, is now playable too, with the use of a cheat code. One of the game's most notable changes though from Killer Instinct 2 is the game's stages themselves. The scaling and distorting of full motion video backgrounds used within the arcade version would not fit on Nintendo's cartridges, so instead every level would need to be painstakingly recreated in full 3D. Doing so still allowed for dynamic camera angles to be used at the beginning of battles. These changes resulted in less memory consumption. Speaking of the cartridge's limitations, it would sadly also result in each fighter in the game having fewer animation frames than its arcade counterpart too. If you want to learn more about Killer Instinct's characters, story and gameplay mechanics, I covered all of this in my first two Killer Instinct game videos. And with Killer Instinct Gold basically being an alternative version of Killer Instinct 2, the characters, story and gameplay mechanics included in this game are the same found within that one. So if you want to learn more about those, then I advise you to watch my Killer Instinct 2 video. As for Gold though, let's check out how this game was received when it finally arrived on the Nintendo 64. Yeah. Surprisingly, overall, Gold generally got favourable reviews over that of its arcade counterpart but many would complain that the title simply did not look good enough for a game that arrived at the end of 1996. iGen, for example, would go as far to comment that apart from looking dated, the characters themselves have a cheesy 80s feel and do not fit into a modern product. IGN would add, though, that they liked Gold's crisp music, but felt the game should have added more characters to the roster to make the game feel more separate to that of Killer Instinct 2, which would have been a welcome addition to the game to be fair, as 11 fighters in a fighting game that never arrived in my country until 1997 did not feel like very many to me either. GameSpot would proclaim Gold to be the most refined version of Killer Instinct ever made, but like many of the reviewers noted how dated the experience was compared to Nintendo 64 games from other genres, thus noting that only those most desperate for a Nintendo 64 fighting game should bother purchasing this one. Next Generation and N64 Magazine both commented that Tekken 2 and Virtua Fighter 2 both made Killer Instinct Gold look extremely primitive, thus outclassing in the cartridge based experience. In N64 Magazine's conclusion, they would harshly draw that even in the Nintendo 64's meager catalogue of titles, Killer Instinct Gold does not distinguish itself, and thus had a lifespan of weeks rather than months. Killer Instinct Gold waned from a celebrated announcement to a quiet release. Next Generation would scathingly write that the controls in the game were as awkward as they were on the Super NES and ultimately wrote that the game was not much fun. Across the board review, sources would note that like many Nintendo 64 games to come, the game suffers from blurriness. To top it off, by this point in time, journalists were no longer impressed by Killer Instinct's quirky combo system. 
For example, IGN would write that this shallow emphasis on archaic combo sequence memorization prevented creative improvisation. CVG wrote that Gold had little flow, every match was focused on huge combos rather than small strategic moves. I guess the biggest problem looking back at Killer Instinct on the Nintendo 64 was that by the time the platform reached homes, Killer Instinct was dated in both graphical style and presentation. Pre-rendered sprites as seen in Killer Instinct and Donkey Kong Country in 1994 now looked dated as hell on 64-bit hardware. Two and a half years removed from the first arcade game's release and the fact that the game was graphically scaled back from the original did not help matters much either. Killer Instinct Gold did not look like an impressive early game on the 64. I can confirm that during the Christmas period that I received the system, my family would buy me four games that year and Killer Instinct Gold was the title I certainly played the least of the four, as it simply did not wow me and blow me away in the same way that Mario 64, Lilac Wars and Mario Kart 64 did. The game just felt primitive in comparison, and when you consider that it was basically a scout back title from 1994, I guess it really was primitive. On my Sony PlayStation, I would purchase Tekken 2 and Tekken 3, and I remember playing those two games to death with my friends. We never tended to give Killer Instinct Gold the same love and attention. It felt like a relic of the past, almost dead on arrival. Overall resulting in Rare not bothering to release another Killer Instinct game for many, many, many years. The game's popularity declined almost as quickly as it rose, as 3D polygon model gaming quickly took over the world. Despite these criticisms though, ironically a strong case can now be argued that Killer Instinct Gold is actually now one of the better Nintendo 64 games to both look at and play today, as although it aged quickly at first, in 2020 it is nowhere near as ugly as most Nintendo 64 games look now. Also to add to this, rather amusingly, despite being one of the first traditional versus fighting games on the Nintendo 64, the game was never topped on the hardware. No high quality polygon fighters like Tekken or Virtual Fighter were ever published for the system in my opinion. So despite its flaws to this day, hilariously this rough around the edges title is remembered as the greatest traditional fighting game that was ever released for Nintendo's gimped hardware, as most third party publishers were simply not interested in this so called project reality system. So whilst the game was arguably dead on its arrival, the game is still the best traditional fighter the 64 ever delivered, which is something to be proud of right? So if you fancy playing a game of this ilk on Nintendo 64's hardware, Killer Instinct Gold will forever be your best ever option. So ladies and gentlemen, that was the mad story of Killer Instinct Gold. By this point in time I have now covered over 50 different fighting games on this channel for you to go back and watch content on. But if you have been here for a while, why not let me know in the comment section down below which fighting game you would like to see me focus on on here next. Today's video was chosen by the smashing people who back this channel over on Patreon, who allow me the pleasure of working on these videos full time for everybody's entertainment. If you want to vote on future topics like these and receive every video early, why not consider backing this channel over on Patreon? Huge shout outs and thank yous go out to Sebastian Velez, Carl Johnson, The Murder of Crows, Heo Paula Lopez, Joseph Rasmick, Doug Perkins, BXL Gotham, Normal Guy, Rowan Dinched, Evan Border, Philip Math, Canva Rambo 82, Aswell Rarakai, Keith Ferguson, Dropkin Varela, Prince Knight, Michael Cullix, Ego, Jordan Durant. TOG Driver, Angel I-35, Alephia Swanson, Timothy W. Haskins II, Nick Daniels, Prince Asana, Carlos Domingo, Sponge B, Glennie Glenn, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of the Ted, Gary Pinkett, EC Professor, Aaron McNamara, Instant Gratification Monkey, Man Shovel, James Bishop, JB, Post DXL, Michael Hall, Barbara Kitty, Ron Studd, Booty McBoo, Langston Miller, Noob, Casey Wright, Zai, Brian Barry, Chris Margarine, Stephen Lewis, Sarah Powell, Vlaming Rene, Sarai H. Al Sarai, Marvin Oaliga, Chris Cole, Adrian Hannington, Bernard NG, Marco Soto, Richard Stu Stewart, James McDonald, Crazy Yarl, Hunter Christian, Time Long Soundwave, Dan Van Darn, Adam Casting, Gregory Smaragiewicz, Rick67, Louis Viant, John Bates, David Bow, Angry Little SOB, Mike Bruno, Chris Fisk, Ivan M, Paul Elliott, Mean Machine Dean, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Tom Elliott, Retroverse.com, Synth Spaces, Andrew Bazansky, and all of my other patrons. 
Thank you very much. Yeah. Cheerio.